Hey, what's up garden friends? Jeff here, Tropical Plant Party. How's everybody doing? I hope you're good. I am great. I wanna talk about the cordolins today. Cordolin, cordoline, cordolini, I've heard it all. There are tons and tons and tons of different varieties, cultivars of the cordolin fruticosa. Lots and lots and lots of variety. All different leaf shapes, colors, patterns within those, and they vary in size an awful lot are a really, really popular ornamental houseplant, tropical plant. They're hardy zones 10 and up. I've seen some places saying zone 9, and I've actually seen them survive in zone 9 multiple times, but they don't always look that great by the time late spring comes around. They bounce back. That being said though, they really do like heat. This is a warm loving plant. So 65 degrees and above is, that's their sweet spot. Kind of similar to a coleus, their light requirements can vary a little bit from variety to variety and from the intensity you wanna see in the foliage. For the most part, it's a plant that likes really bright indirect light. That's especially true inside. Lots and lots of light in the house. Unless you have very, very, very sunny windows, they don't need to be scorched. You know, they don't need direct light beaming on them at all times. So in the home, roughly like four to five hours of indirect light should do just fine for them. Outdoors is gonna be a little bit different just because there's differences in the intensity of lighting. With a lot of plants that have colorful foliage, it's usually suggested that to get the intensity of the colors to come out, to increase their light. There seems to be a uh, middle ground, a nice happy place in between highlight and low light to get really intense color out of these plants. So while they can be grown in shade outdoors, they really do better with a little bit more light than that. I like to make sure mine get at least four to five hours of bright morning light and then dappled filter light throughout the rest of the day. And again, that is gonna vary from variety to variety. If I had one that had a lot of white in its foliage, I might reduce that back a little bit just for, to prevent squirrels in the bright intense afternoon sun and this one right here which I mean I almost did a spotlight just on this particular cordolin because even though it's not the most colorful it has a very interesting structure to it doesn't it the way everything fans out from the center and as they grow up it will twist kind of like a screw pine it'll have a really neat spiraling shape to it really neat variety oh and the variety is called Singapore twist if you are wondering probably good to throw that out there too I've also seen it called Singapore twist showgirl also Singapore twist um, New Guinea fan anyways back to lighting and the leaf intensity the colors of the foliage the color can also be influenced by the time of year during the summer sometimes the colors will be a little bit less intense things will tilt more towards the kind of brownish areas instead of being really bright and intense like they might be in the winter time. That has a little bit to do with the uh, day lengths, the angle of the sun. Uh, really I, a lot of it I think has to do with the availability of carbohydrates and what they're taking up through the soil, but I hear and read mixed things with that. It, but whatever the case, they're typically more vibrant when it's not summertime, like super intense heat outside. So if you have your Thai plant and you move it outside and you're like, oh, it faded, it doesn't look that good. That's probably fairly normal. As far as changing in the intensity of the colors goes, though, if things are getting patchy and there's brown spots and things like that, that's a different story. We'll talk about that in a minute. The whole point here is just that there can be variation in the colors. If you notice the intensity of the colors changing throughout the year, it isn't necessarily something to worry about. This one right here, the Singapore Twist, that what I had originally started to talk about, this one I actually just picked up. I saw it at a nursery a few weeks ago. It was in one of my vlogs and then I just I haven't really been able to stop thinking about it with the changing time of year things are it's still summer but everybody's getting ready for fall tropicals are growing clearance so I went up and I grabbed it this one at the nursery I got it from has been sitting in full intense blazing sun all summer long we haven't had the hottest summer but it's still been sitting on top of asphalt for months and it looks okay it's got some broken leaves and stuff on it but that's all right main thing is I don't see any sun damage there's no photo oxidation happening here no bleaching so it's all good whole point there being that a lot of the times they can take full intense sun too if growing as a house plant though and you want to move it outside into the springtime I would wait until late spring or just until basically your minimum temperatures outside are above 60 degrees 55 60 somewhere in there start it out in the shade even if it's getting a lot of light in the house put it someplace that's shady at least with filtered light because that transition can scorch them and then every couple weeks move them to more and more light transition them slowly over to full sun when they've been inside which is true of pretty much any house plant that you take from inside to outside even if it's a full sun loving plant that's been getting full sun in the house 
full sun in the house is not the same as full sun outdoors. Watering these plants, very, very simple. Don't like to dry out, so basically just keep them wet. They like an organically rich, well-drained potting mix that's slightly on the acidic side. I'll talk about why it needs to be more on the acidic side in a little bit when I talk about some issues with the plants, but for the most part, keep them wet. If they, the top of the soil dries out, that's okay. But during the growing season, which is gonna be spring through summer, wanna keep them watered on a regular basis. And that doesn't mean that they like to have wet feet, meaning that the bottom of the pot shouldn't be sitting in water. It should be allowed to dry somewhat in between, just not heavily, not very much. The soil for the most part needs to stay evenly moist. During the fall and winter, cut back on watering, especially if you're moving these in the house. Inside, again, I already talked about the lighting and everything but during the fall and winter reduce the watering don't worry about letting it dry out a little bit it should be fine not for too terribly long but longer than you would outdoors and you'll get to know the plant once you've grown them for a while in the house when temperatures aren't really intense and they're not getting the same amount of lighting they're not wanting to be in a really active growth so keeping the soil wet is just going to be problematic again water them of course i would say at least weekly water them until the water runs all the way up the bottom of the pot but let it dry out more than you would when it's outside this is where things like moisture meters can come in really handy and pop that into the soil when it's on the low end of moist that would be a good time to go ahead and water the plant fertilizing is a little bit more complicated i mean it really isn't i've always just fertilize them with a balanced water soluble fertilizer i usually put a slow release in every 60 days during the growing season and i do a water soluble once a month it's not always a bad idea to dilute the fertilizer for the Thai plants by about a quarter strength. And that's because sometimes the roots can be a little bit more sensitive to like getting burned from the fertilizers. I've never had that problem. A lot of that is going to have to do with soil pH. Like I said, I haven't had that issue, but if you live someplace where you have really alkaline water or super, super acidic water, then quarter strength, good idea. It's not gonna hurt it to do that, especially if it's already in a really nice, organically rich potting mix, then it's not that big of a deal anyways. Just put a continuous in there in the late spring, early summer, and then once a month, hit it with a quarter strength, maybe half strength, all-purpose fertilizer if that's water soluble, should be good. And then when talking about the soil pH, like I mentioned before, Sometimes can suffer from uh, like fluoride toxicity. There can be fluoride in the tap water. Sometimes it's even in fertilizers. There are a lot of different places fluoride can be. And generally soils that are more towards the neutral range on the pH, meaning seven and up, they tend to uptake that fluoride more heavily. So if that soil pH is more between six, 6.5, which is more on the acidic side, then it's not likely to take that fluoride up. And what the fluoride does is it causes, basically you're gonna notice that the foliage just doesn't look good on the plant. If you're growing one of these and for no rhyme or reason, the foliage is discolored, it's browning, the foliage is, the new growth is coming up kind of brown and weird looking, that could mean that there's some fluoride issues going on. You can get online, check with your local water municipalities and it should have all of your levels of everything that's in your water listed there. If not, you can usually have them sent off. There are even kits you can get at like Lowe's and Home Depot to have your water tested. And you could give that a try if that's what's going on. And that's the same thing when growing these in the ground. If you have an alkaline soil and you're noticing like, hey, this isn't looking good, might want to go ahead and put something in there to acidify that soil a little bit. And that's one of the reasons that a peat-based potting mix sometimes is a little bit better with these plants, especially if you're growing them as a house plant and you have some place with hard alkaline water, that peat helps to acidify things a little bit. And these are a plant that like a lot of humidity. So when growing this indoors, having it in a bathroom or just, just any humid area is gonna be a little bit better for them. It's not a plant that I would recommend misting only because they can suffer very easily from various forms of fusarium, which are basically there can be fungal infections very easily from water sitting on the foliage, particularly in the crown of the plant where everything is emerging from the center, where all the nooth is, nooth, where all the new growth is coming from. That can be an area where you don't want water collecting. So misting the plants can be a little bit more risky indoors where there's not as much airflow to dry them out quickly. But if you're growing them outdoors and you're getting a lot of rain, I haven't had many issues and we have had tons and tons of rain this year. That hasn't caused any problems for me as far as fungus or anything goes. There's been a lot of snails, lots of slugs and snails. They love these guys, but 
that's a whole separate issue. Speaking of pests, very attractive to mealybugs. When you have these inside, it's a good idea to check in between all the little nooks and crannies, all the crevices, the tops, the bottoms of the foliage. Remove them by hand as soon as you start seeing them. Spray with neem oil, take them to the shower, give them a heavy, heavy rinse, and then reapply the neem oil it can be a headache getting the mealybugs off of these guys. Other pests can be a problem like spider mites, white fly, I don't think is a huge issue on these guys, but it can happen. I haven't heard a lot about scale being a problem, but I would think that soft leaf scale could be an issue, particularly on the newest growth. That's where soft leaf scale tends to live and wreak havoc. If growing these part in the nursery pot, I haven't repotted this yet because like I said, I just picked this up. But some mealybugs do live beneath the soil surface and that would be a time to make sure to flush with an insecticide or water containing some like peppermint oil, something like that. And if doing so, make sure that it's not sitting in a drainage dish because it's gonna collect there and that can be bad for the plant. It needs to wash through. Another great option are beneficial nematodes. You can release those nematodes into the soil and they'll help eat up those mealybugs or any nasty critters that might be living down there. Brown edges on the leaves and brown tips can be an indication that the plant needs more humidity, that the air is a little bit too dry. Maybe it's near a draft, maybe the humidity is not too bad, maybe it's just in a spot where there's too much airflow. Maybe you just move the plant, that might be just fine. Yellowing foliage typically means that they're getting too much water. Maybe they're sitting in water. Check to make sure that the plant's drying out between waterings. So like I said, it doesn't need to dry out all the way. Just make sure if you water the plant once a week and five, six days later after watering it, it's still sopping wet, that's that's not great. Sometimes browning and yelling of the lower foliage is just kind of the plant shedding some old growth. Not a big deal. They do drop their old foliage. Sometimes they'll hold on to it for many, many years. Sometimes these guys will grow and just have like, I don't know, maybe six to ten leaves growing out the top and just a lot of stem below. There are a lot of variables that go into why that happens. Some people will pull those off because they like the open trunk look a little bit better. I'm somewhat one of those people, but with this one in particular, the Singapore Twist, I won't be doing that because its interesting shape is, well, in the foliage. That's what gives it the neat characteristics that drew me to it. Extremely easy to propagate. You can sow their seeds like this one up here. I went ahead and left this on for the video. You can see the inflorescence, the old flower up there, and there are even some tiny little seeds on it. The flowers are pretty cool looking. Actually, I don't, all the ones I have are done flowering, but you can see it had a neat shape to it. And they're covered in teeny tiny little white flowers. I think have a little bit of a pink center and a slightly yellow outline, but you have to look close. But if you look close, you can be like, whoa, that's really cool. So you can sow the seeds, but it's really not necessary. It's not necessary because these propagate from cuttings incredibly easily. You can just generally done from the top. You can make your cutting across the top of the plant, remove the lower few leaves so that there's about, I'd say, two and a half to four inches of open stem. Dip that into some rooting hormones, stick it in a nice rich potting mix that's going to stay consistently moist. You don't want to dry out too quickly. If you're doing this indoors, maybe put a bag over the top to help hold in some humidity, open it occasionally so that you don't have to worry about fungus and things building up. That's pretty much it though. They'll root just from doing that. You can just cut the top off, stick it in the soil. If you have one of these and they're getting kind of lanky, and maybe looking a little bit top heavy, that happens sometimes, then one of the options is to just top it off and you can take the growth you took off the top, remove the lower foliage, dip it in rooting hormone, stick it back into the soil and new growth will sprout out the sides of where you made the cut. You can see here on the trunk of this one, this one right here, the portion to the right, when that gets cut, then that's it for that growth, but it will branch out the sides, and that's what this one's done. The Thai plants are a fantastic plant to have around. They add tons of interest wherever you put them in the garden or in a pot in the house. They draw the eye in because they have such unique foliage, such unique color. If you live someplace like I do, I'm in 6B, cannot grow this outdoors all year as a perennial. Just gonna pause for an airplane, be right back. Then a really good cold hardy substitute for a cordolin if you want that interest that maybe you've seen in magazines or on Instagram, wherever, where you see these in gardens, you go, oh, that's so beautiful. Cannas. Cannas, now it's not the same shape, obviously, but they have really bright 
vibrant bold foliage to them they're really easy to grow and even though they're typically rated as hardy zone like 7b and up if you cut them back below that like even in zone 5 as long as you know i mean they'd be situated properly you cut them back throw a bag of mulch on top of them typically most varieties will come back when things get nice and warm in the late spring early summer the next year seems kind of like deviating a little bit but for some people they may really like the appearance of the plant they just don't want to grow it as a house plant and it's not really something that's practical to buy as an annual i have a lot of them that i'm treating as annuals this year that i got on clearance last winter and they looked terrible they were like a dollar and they grow fast enough that I was like, I don't really care about that, but they were also only a dollar, so I'm not going to fuss over them in the winter time, except for, I mean, this one and some of the other ones that I've shown in this video. Well, only the ones I've shown in this video. Those weren't really clearance plants. Some of them were. Anyways, you get the point. They're really pretty, fairly easy to grow indoors, maybe a little bit more tricky. Don't over fuss with them, though. That's the main thing. Take them inside, keep them well watered. Don't let them be sopping wet and you're pretty much good. Do not fertilize these during the winter time. Should have said that before. Do not fertilize in the winter time. They will stay in active growth even though they're not getting the light or the conditions for them to be in active growth and you'll get a really stretched out lanky weird looking plant. It's not good. Okay, that's all. Comment down below. Say hi. Any tips, tricks? All you Floridians, go ahead and chirp on in. Talk about your cordylands, things you've been doing with yours, where you've seen them. I don't know, you know, just whatever. I'm going to pop this up into something that's hopefully going to be really pretty. I don't know yet, but I'm going to work on that maybe in the next video or next week. I'm not positive, but I will have updates as always with everything on Instagram. All my social media is down below it's a good place to contact me and get a hold of me or just like i said look for updates that's, that's usually where i am is on instagram don't forget to leave the video a thumbs up it makes a really big difference for the channel i really appreciate it so thank you very 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 much for doing so and subscribe as well and hit that notification box upload multiple times a week and that way you'll know when new videos come out all right as always and most importantly everybody keep on growing bye bye